they asked me to um, start off this speech with a kick. He keeps getting them in and getting them. I mean. Dewey, you cannot eat this stuff. You know what the best thing to do? If you can get in there, just pull it out like a comb. Oh. Going right, man? Oh. So for all of you guys who laughed at that, it really wasn't that funny. <laughs> it was a pretty serious incident. As you can see, he broke his sunglasses. <laughs> and when you're on a big journey like that, it's not like you can just replace your sunglasses anywhere. So it's a pretty, pretty unfortunate deal. Um, but so this was... About two weeks into a five and a half month long trip, we were in southern Arizona. And by this point in time, we had lost our horses once. Our director had taken a brutal kick to the femur and was uh, MIA. And it was just this really uh, interesting time when our horses were covered in cactus and we're like, how the hell are we going to? get through this, but we managed to pull it off. But before we get to how we were there, and then where we went from after Ben got punched in the head, um, how did it all get started? And Unbranded for me started whenever I was a kid. Um, I grew up in a wonderful family in Amarillo, Texas, and Amarillo is a place that it is almost entirely private land, and it's really flat. If you've ever been through Amarillo, you probably have an appreciation for mountains. That is my beautiful sister, who's also right there. Thanks for coming. Um, and um, whenever I was 14, I took my first real trip to the mountains. We went to Colorado, and... Uh, we went into this wilderness area and it just blew my mind that there was that much land that didn't have roads and fences and highways and power lines and vehicles and all of these things that I had just, you know, associated with life. Like we didn't really have a big wilderness area or a lot of public lands where I grew up. And I thought, man, this is, this is incredible. We did like a 10 mile hiking trip and it just completely changed my perspective of what a watershed is and what a landscape is. Uh, so I ended up going back to the same spot with my brother and my sister and we got rained on for like four days and they were like, man, we're not doing that again. And I, I loved it. It was awesome. Um, Cause you know, when it rains and the sun comes out, it's awesome. So I left that and then I went to to, to Texas A&M University. Nice. I was hoping we'd get a few of those. Um, and my, after my freshman year of college, I um, got a job in Colorado working for a guy in Rocky Mountain National Park and had just the most amazing four months. I got to take people on rides. We did two hour rides and we did uh, two day trips and we would take people to see different parts of the park and learn about different natural history of the area. And that's really where my love for horses uh, developed. I didn't really have a lot of riding experience before that. Uh, I'm still, I'm learning a lot, but that was where it all got started. And one day, 
we were just hanging out and I had a map of Colorado and we're looking at it and there was this, this trail that went all the way through the state, the Continental Divide Trail. So I was sitting there with my buddy Mike and I was like, dude, we should, we should do that trail. Um, and he's like, yeah, well, we should, but let's go ahead and add on Montana and, and Wyoming and, and New Mexico too. And I thought that was a pretty good idea. So we started planning for that. I had to go back to school where I decided to drop out of the business school and I entered into the wildlife program instead. Because after a summer like this, like, honestly, who wants to study accounting? <laughs> um, and I'll never forget my, my counselor. She was like, now, Ben, do you understand how prestigious the Mays School of Business is? And I was like, yeah. And she, and she told me that I was the first person to ever transfer from the business school to the wildlife school. And one day I went from playing with calculators in class to playing with snakes in class. And it was like the best decision possibly of my life. Um, Y'all should all drop out of business school and join the wildlife school. It was, it was amazing. And during that period of time, I met a guy named Parker Flannery, and him and Mike Pinckney, uh, the guy from Colorado, we all put together this, this idea of we're going to do the Continental Divide Trail with horses. So I called my mom and was like, Mom, I'm going to drop out of school and ride horses in the mountains, which went over really well. <laughs> and um, we didn't have any money, because my mom was like, well, I don't know about supporting that. <laughs> Uh, so we started looking for horses. We had enough money to buy a few, few ranch horses, but we heard about this government program that had a bunch of wild Mustangs that needed homes. So we went and we adopted some, some wild Mustangs to use on the trip. And Parker, this is Parker. He trained them. He is like a raging badass. Um, he's in Australia now training Brumbies. Um, so he, he trained some of the Mustangs and we did the journey. Uh, there's Mike Pinkney. This was in the Wind River Range, but just unbelievable. And this was before I got into photography. Uh, and it was just like this little point and shoot camera, but it's just a, an amazing journey. Um, we got to see just some sites that'll stick with you for the rest of your life. And it, um, this was kind of near the end. This was in Glacier National Park. But it was neat for me to, because I was the map geek in that trip. And it was really cool to buy these maps and pick her out, and then you kind of get a vision for what it might look like, and then you watch it unfold in real life. And it gave me a lot of um, a lot of appreciation for how much public lands we we have in the American West. I mean, it blows my mind that today, in the year 2017, there is still a corridor of public lands that you can go from Mexico to Canada through an almost entirely backcountry route that anybody, any average show can go on. That to me is just like, what an amazing gift. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I don't think a lot of people understand. Everybody's like, oh, public lands. Like, yeah, we got Yellowstone, Bison, thumbs up. But uh, there's, it's so much more to that. And I also felt like the Mustangs that we had adopted that did so well on this trip. You know, they never got hurt. They never got tired. Uh, they finished as fat as can be. Didn't have any, any hoof problems at all. Um, you know, I was just so impressed by the wild horses. And whenever that journey finished, I looked at those guys and I was like, fellas, we should do this again. But this time we should take cameras and we should film it and make a movie. 
y'all in? And they were like, hell no. <laughs> I'm cold and I'm tired. Uh, you're on your own, man. Um, so we, or I guess I at that point in time, started brainstorming and wanting to do another one. And a big reason for me of wanting to do it was I started researching the wild horse and burrow issue, which is a tricky one. And fast forward like five years, I ended up making a film about wild horses and burrows. And I took out two minutes to show you guys a video that kind of explains what the uh, current conundrum is in the American West regarding horses. Horses reproduce quickly, and if they get overpopulated, they can destroy rangeland habitat that wildlife depend on. So the BLM rounds up excess horses to prevent overgrazing and offer them up for adoption. But there aren't enough adopters, and they've begun to stockpile. There are nearly 50,000 wild horses and burrows in government holding pens, costing taxpayers about 50 million annually. Wild horse numbers have continued to rise, and right now there are over two and a half times the number of horses that is the appropriate management level. It's ignited a range war between wild horse advocates who think that the appropriate management level is too low, between ranchers who want more livestock, and wildlife organizations that want priority to be put on native species. The horses don't have a place to go. There's not enough adopters. They virtually have no predators. And overgrazing is real. Overgrazing leads to desertification. It allows invasive species and weeds to take over. And in severe cases, they could starve. All right, so that's a big issue in two minutes. But to boil it down, there's tens of thousands of horses in these holding pens. And I had just gotten done with this journey, and I was like, man, a lot of these are amazing horses. Um, you know, can we do the journey again, and can we try to shed some light on this situation and to get some of these horses adopted? Um, so I... Went to Texas A&M, which is a good environment to find people crazy enough to ride for 3,000 miles. <laughs> Always count on them. Uh, and, um, and I met these three guys. This is Ben Thamer. He's from Amarillo, Texas, a fellow Amarilloan. And this is Thomas Glover. He's from Houston. And... Um, this is Johnny Fitzsimmons from San Antonio, and we all had a bunch of stuff in common at A&M, and we decided to embark on this 3,000-mile journey after graduation uh, from Mexico to Canada and to document it and make a film about it and uh, try to have a conservation message in it and, and a wild horse adoption message in it. It's kind of ambitious, maybe, looking back on it especially the whole filming part, because none of us had ever made a movie before. And none of us, like, had any money because we just graduated. And we're like, well, we should do a Kickstarter. Uh, do I have any Kickstarter donors in here by chance? Do I don't? I don't have any. Y'all are all terrible people. <laughs> um, so we put together a four-minute video that said, all right, we just graduated. Our goal is to make a film to inspire wild horse adoptions by doing this ride. Will you give us money? And in 45 days, that video spread like madness. And we had over 1,000 people donate over $200,000 to make a film on Unbranded, which is just amazing to me. Like... Uh, there's a lot of good human beings on this planet. And you know, I'm eternally grateful for all those people that, that put us there. So we met a director named Phil Baraboo, and we went and we rode from Mexico to Canada, and we made a movie. And before I dive into it, I want to show you all the trailer so you know what I'm talking about. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. 
And sometimes that bad judgment can be pretty horrific. ready to, to buy a house and get married and have kids yet, you know. I want to have fun and do some crazy adventure like this while I can. Give them hell, Tommy! It's a trip of self-discoveries. We recently adopted less than 3,000. What do we do with the excess wild horses that we have to remove? Do these horses have a right to be here? Yeah, absolutely they do. To prove the worth of these Mustangs, we're going to adopt, train, and ride them 3,000 miles from Mexico to Canada through the wildest terrain in the American West. Yeah! Oh God, send me down. Things are going to go wrong. So much fun. <laughs> that goal of reaching the Canadian line didn't as powerful as the impact that going through this land is made on me. Well, you can do a lot of things, but you can't do this. And this is for crazy people, <laughs> really. was fun. You guys should all ride from Mexico to Canada, by the way. Um, so I guess I gotta hit the button, but where it all started was um, in prison. We went to a inmate training facility where they have about 800 horses in Hutchinson, Kansas. And they have a program where inmates can train these horses. And then they take these saddle-ready horses and pass them out. So if you're going to go to jail, you know, training horses would be a good way to spend your time, at least in my opinion. Um, so we went there, and they had, they had all these horses, and we just started sorting through them. We looked for confirmation was a big one. You know, we wanted horses that were big enough to do the journey, we wanted horses that, um, you know, were, were large enough. A lot of the Mustangs are pretty small. We looked for bigger horses. We looked for a variety of physical traits. And we also looked for disposition. You know, we didn't want the horses that were the most dominant animals. And we also didn't want the ones that were at the bottom of the pecking order. We kind of wanted those in the middle, hoping to have the assumption that they would be... Um, chill because we had a bunch that's a lot of horses to train so we adopted these horses with the help of two professional trainers jerry jones and lanny leach who are professionals and they knew exactly what to look for and uh definitely want to give them some credit and we took them to hutchinson kansas i'm sorry uh to near weatherford texas where we began the training process and if you guys have never trained a horse, y'all are really missing out because it's one of the most um, satisfying and like accomplishy kind of feeling things that I've ever done in my life to watch an animal that is a prey species and is scared of you and watch it over time develop trust and you know become a team and to learn new things and to do different things. And, and uh, you know, I think a good horseman is just a beautiful piece of art to watch. And as we were training these horses, there was this one horse in particular named Sea Star. I felt like I was really developing a bond with Sea Star. And one day he was out there in the pen and I, um, I walked up to him. We've had him for like two or three days. I walked up to him and I kind of put my arm out. I like gently walked up and kind of put my eyes down, you know, very not dominant, not a predator type of feeling. And he reached out and he sniffed my hand. 
And I was like, oh, I'm connecting with this horse right now. And he just rears up and just clocks me. <laughs> like, sends me sprawling. And I was like, oh, maybe next week. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we did. We successfully got the horses trained. Uh, there was three of them that we did not get to the point where we felt comfortable taking them on the trip. Um, and they're living on a pasture now, living a good life. But uh, we started the journey. Um, oh, this is Gray Horse. He kicks everybody, which is really inconsiderate. Um, cause, you know, he kicks like a horse. Uh, but we got them all trained, and, and we, gave it, we gave it a lot of time. I mean, we spent probably four or five months preparing the horses to become physically fit, for us to become physically fit, because we were asking a lot out of them. And we wanted to make sure that we could take as good a care of them as we possibly could. While we were doing the training, we chose our route uh, through Arizona. We mainly did the Arizona Trail. Through Utah, we mainly did the Great Western Trail. Um, we just went through Idaho. And, and then we went into Wyoming and kind of got along the Continental Divide Trail and took a lot of that through Montana. And to give you a perspective of the different kinds of agencies or jurisdictions that we went through, you know, the different colors or different land management agencies. So we went through a variety of national forests, national parks, wilderness areas, private land. Um, and you can see that a lot of it is out in the West. This is where the majority of our public lands in the lower 48 is located. 